Our whole economy depends on transport. Almost all the planes, trains and automobiles that keep it running are powered by petroleum. The world uses more of it every year. So what if that fuel supply one day stops growing or even starts to decline? If we don't anticipate that moment, our economies could collapse. I'm off to Paris to meet the man who's responsible for working out if and when that moment will arrive. Though you're unlikely to have heard of him, he's one of the most powerful men on Earth. He's the chief economist of the International Energy Agency. Every year he publishes its World Energy Outlook. Most of the world's governments treat his reports as the petroleum gospel. But what if he's wrong? I arrived on the day the new report was released. The information it contains is radically different to the projections it published last year. If the world's governments have been building their transport strategies on the wrong forecasts, we could all be in serious trouble. So I went to ask the chief economist, Fatih Birol, what had changed and why. In the new report, you suggest that the rate of decline in the output of the world's oil fields will be about 6.7% a year. In last year's report, you said it's 3.7% a year. That's a major change, isn't it? That's right. For the first time this year, we undertook a major study in the World Energy Outlook 2008. Namely, we look at 800 fields, the largest fields of the world, to see how they are going to decline. And we came up with 6.7%. So what was the 3.7% figure based on that was in your report last year? It was mainly an assumption, a global assumption about the, about the world's uh, oil fields. This year, we look at the uh, country by country, uh, field by field, and we look at also onshore and offshore. It was very, very detailed. And last year, it was an assumption, and this year, it's a finding of our uh, study. But, but it seems extraordinary to me that you hadn't done that work before, that you'd made this assumption, which the whole world depended on, and yet you hadn't done that research which supported the assumption. In fact, uh, nobody has done that research, and this research we have done this year is the first time in the world, and this is the first publicly available uh, data in that respect. You've also dramatically re-forecast the future price of oil, haven't you? Um, in last year's report, you said that the likely price of oil in 2030 was going to be $62 a barrel. Now, in the new report, you say it's going to be $120 a barrel. That's a huge difference. What I said is that the investment needs, with the, as a result of the higher decline rates, investment needs are much bigger than we thought in the past. The higher the investment needs are, the, the risk of deferment uh, turns to be a higher price trajectory. It is the reason why we have this $120. But the, the governments of the world have been basing their transport infrastructure, which is totally dependent on oil, right. on the assessments produced by the IEA. Those assessments have now radically changed between 2007 and 2008. I don't agree. Does that mean that, I don't that agree those with you. governments... I don't well, agree with you. Well, well, well 3.7% to 6.7%, no, no, that's not I a radical I change? I don't, I don't $60 to $120, that's not a radical change? I, I don't agree with you. We still say, and we said in the past, that oil, one day we will run out of oil. We never, we never said that we will have uh, tens of uh, years of, uh, hundreds of years of oil. We will run out of oil and we will prepare ourselves for that very day. But we you now certain. say we're running out and twice as quickly as you said last year. No, it is not. I can tell you uh, that uh, our, uh, we have a consistent line, but what we have is that uh, this year, compared to past years, we have uh, seen that the decline rates are significantly higher than what we have uh, seen uh, before, but our line that we are on an uh, unsustainable energy uh, path has not changed and even became much more uh, vocal this year. Sure, it, it has. And the picture you painted in the past was far too optimistic. And yet, on that far too optimistic picture, businesses and governments have based their future growth plans. 
I, I hope that you are right that the governments are listening to us. I am not, I am not as optimistic as you are. I, I would, well, I would, my I government would, constantly would, says would, we don't need I, to create our own I assessment would, because we rely totally I, on the IAEA's. I IAAs. would consider this as a, as a compliment, which I hope uh, we deserve. But we told our governments, including your government, that the, the energy pet we are following is an unsustainable one. Mr Birol's report says that the supply of ordinary petroleum will go into decline, but it suggests that the world's demand can still be met by exploiting what it calls unconventional oil. This means resources like the Canadian tar sands. Mining them causes much more environmental damage and higher carbon emissions than drilling conventional oil. In the report you say that supplies of conventional oil yeah. may well plateau before 2030. In fact, yes. you anticipate that yes. they will plateau yes. before 2030. So you, you are relying for that, that shortfall to be made up by the digging of the tar sands in Alberta. And, and you assume that there's going to be no One of them. regulatory but, but, yeah. problems there yeah. and that, it, that no. it will go ahead. No, it is not so simple. What we say is that the, we look at the non-conventional oil. There's a huge potential there. And the, uh, what we assume is that the, their contribution will uh, grow up to, in Canada, for example, up to around 7 million barrels per day in 2030. But there's a contradiction here, isn't there? Because the half of your report, which talks about climate change, says we should not be developing resources like the Canadian tar no, we don't say that. We well, don't say that we, we should well, not. Uh, you make it very clear that yeah. if those are developed, yeah. it'll be global catastrophe. I think you use that term yourself, a, a massive climate change disruption. And so the clear implication is we have to, to cut that production. On the other hand, you were saying that we need to raise that production in order to cov cover the shortfall yeah, in oil supplies. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, <clears throat> the, uh, the contribution coming from the uh, tar sands it will be about, as I told, about 7 million barrels per day. And this is about 7-8% uh, total oil production. This is still peanuts. Bulk of the not CO2 in climate change terms, I'm, I'm coming to that. Bulk of the CO2 emissions in the future will come from use of coal. But to dismiss seven million barrels per day of Canadian tar sands as peanuts in terms of its impact on global climate change is at odds with what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and just about every scientific authority on Earth mm. has been saying about the development of those unconventional sources. I think non-conventional resources have two uh, tasks. One, in terms of energy security, they are important and they are useful, and coal is the same. And in terms of the climate change, they may have, uh, they may have negative results if they are not produced in a sustainable manner. But there are many areas that we can easily, and with lower cost, reduce the CO2 emissions. For example, using coal in the context of uh, capturing the carbon, or instead of coal, using nuclear power or, or renewable uh, energies or improving the energy efficiency. So I think it is better to look at it in a, a more uh, broader picture where we can get the gains in order to reduce the CO2 emissions. For the first time, this new report mentions that conventional oil supplies could peak or plateau at some point. But the wording in the report is vague. The International Energy Agency has never given a specific date for this event until now. The 2008 report says that conventional supplies of oil are likely to stop growing before 2030. Can you give me a more precise date than that? Assuming that OPEC will invest in a timely manner, the global conventional oil still can still continue, but we still expect that it will come around, 2000 to around 2020 to a plateau as well which is, of course, uh, not a good news from a global oil supply point of view. OK, so if we're going to see a plateau of conventional oil by 2020, that causes potentially some possibly major problems, doesn't it? I mean, the, the Hirsch report that was commissioned by the US Department of Energy um, said that we might need 20 years to prepare for that moment. Otherwise, I quote, the economic, social and political costs will be unprecedented. So if what you're saying is correct, we've left it too late, haven't we? In this book, we are uh, asking for a global energy revolution. The reason we are asking for a global energy revolution is prepare uh, everybody uh, for uh, difficult uh, days and difficult uh, times. I think we should be very careful 
that uh, we make our policies ranging from the efficiency policies to research and development to get the new technologies in place in a timely manner. And if that global energy revolution doesn't take place, what then happens? Then we will have much more difficult days than we had uh, last uh, summer, in 2008 summer, in terms of uh, uh, prices, uh, first of all. This is the economic effect. And there are also some other uh, implications. For example, there will be a huge uh, transfer of wealth from the consuming nations, from OECD countries, from Asia, to very few number of countries. And of course, this transfer of wealth may have many implications on the energy sector and beyond. Now, in 2005, the executive director of the International Energy Agency called people who take the view, exactly the view that you've just expressed, doomsayers, and said that none of this is a cause for concern. Will your agency now apologize to the people he maligned? I don't know what our uh, uh, executive director in 2005 said. Uh, he dismissed he, the whole he, argument he, he, that you've he, just put forward. No, the argument I put forward is, I believe, is a valid one, and uh, what I believe is a strong one, and uh, uh, maintained by uh, facts and figures. So will your agency now apologize to the people he maligned by calling them doomsayers for saying exactly what you just told me? I, I don't know if uh, you should ask this question to our current executive director. So for the first time, the author of the Petroleum Gospel has given us a date for what could be the defining event of the 21st century. This changes everything, or it should. Unless we immediately start reducing the amount of transport fuel we use, one of two things will happen. Either our economies will depend on extremely polluting sources of fuel, like the tar sands, or they will screech to a halt when the oil supply declines. <laughs>